Good morning and thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, uh, how to build a cocktail of funding for your community group. Um, I'm excited to say this is the second in a new series of free webinars that Good Finance will be hosting in 2018, um, so a bit more on that later. Just before we begin, uh, can I just check that my microphone is working properly and that you can hear me? Um, can you please either click thumbs up or type yes into the question panel, onto the chat panel? Brilliant, fantastic. Lots of lots of yeses there, so that's great. Great to see. Um, it's just worth noting that this webinar is being recorded uh, and there will be slides also available after the session uh, and all slides and recordings will be sent round to your emails after after uh, 12 today. Also, can you presenting from three different locations? We have three hosts today, so please do bear with us if we encounter uh, any technical difficulties. Just to uh, introduce ourselves, so my name is Kieran, I'm the project manager for Good Finance, which is a website and initiative to help social enterprises, community groups and charities better understand the world of social investment and um, repayable finance. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Debbie Lamb, who will be co-hosting with me today. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Kieran. And I'm also joined by uh, Simon from Stratford Public Hall, who will be telling his story a little bit later on. Hi, Simon. Hi, Kieran. Hope everyone can hear me clearly. <laughs> Great to have you both with us. Um, just quickly before we begin, uh, a quick a, a overview of what we'll be covering today, uh, hopefully in about 45 minutes. So firstly, Debbie will be taking us through various funding options, particularly for buildings and assets. Uh, I'll then be providing a very uh, brief overview to social investment before talking about some of the, the types that are most applicable to community groups and what you might need to know to work out if it's right for you. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to Simon and he'll be telling us the story about Stratford, uh, Stratford Public Hall uh, and how they raised finance through community shares. Uh, and then lastly, we'll be finishing up with a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them into the question box on your panel uh, of your screen. Please make sure it's in the question box, not on the comments box. Otherwise, we won't be able to pick them up at the end of the session. So we'll be selecting a few of those questions uh, to answer at the end. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Debbie. Debbie. Thanks, Kieran. I'm going to be talking about financing capital, financing buildings and assets. And I thought I'd better tell you a little bit about who I am and locality. At locality, we believe in the power of community to create a fairer society. Um, we're a national organisation, um, a membership organisation which provides specialist advice and support, peer learning and networking, resources to get people involved, and try to campaign for a better operating environment for community organisations. Um, I'm just aware that somebody's having problems hearing me. Is that a problem for others? I'll try to speak up a bit. Okay, um, just to say, I'm, um, I'm Debbie Lamb. I have about 16 years of business support experience with locality and its predecessors. Um, I've worked with organizations acquiring buildings and also those where they've acquired buildings and they've had problems. Um, I'm also an investment panel member for Key Fund, which is a social investor across the north. Um, so what do we mean by buildings and assets? Um, I think we need to look really broadly at it. So we might be talking about sports centres, libraries, heritage buildings, parks, woodlands, community housing. We might also be talking about machinery or equipment for your community business. I think there are three key elements that we need to look at before we get on to thinking about raising capital and i'm just going to refer to them very quickly that's the revenue business plan the asset itself and governance then we go on to raising the capital so in terms of a revenue business plan i think that's the starting point um and just put really simply looking at the asset the land the building the piece of machinery what will generate income and what will the running costs be? Those are the simple things that need to go into a business plan and the financial projections, which any funder is going to want to see 
before they will invest in you. But more importantly, it's going to show you the information that you need to know that the project you're proposing is going to be financially viable in the long term. I think it's important to also to think about the asset and to think about it dispassionately. It can be really difficult if it's a much loved building or piece of land, or if the local authority is, for example, offering an asset transfer of a building or a piece of land. Um, it, we're always told not to look a gift horse in the mouth, but I think you really should in these kind of instances. And really look at the advantages and the disadvantages. Um, you know, it may be great to be offered something at less than market value, but if you've got to do loads of work for the layout, you've got to remove asbestos, you've got to put a new wiring system in, maybe it's not as good value as it might seem at first, at first sight. So it is looking at what are the costs to acquire, to refurbish or do up so that it's fit for purpose, and if you are looking at something like machinery or um, via community business, there may be training implications as well so that people can use it. In terms of governance, I think there's a straightforward issue about your organisational structure. And Kieran's going to talk a bit later about community shares and um, community shares. And community shares imply particular forms of organisational structure to minimise the regulation costs. Um, but more generally, you do need to think about your organisational structure to ensure that, for example, if you want to borrow money, you have the right to do it. The other thing I think you need to think about is whether you have the resources. For many people, getting a building or a piece of land is a scaling up. You need a skilled board which has the capacity and the time and the enthusiasm to support the process. And you need to be realistic about you know, the staff support you might need to make this happen. Capital funding is generally a patchwork or a cocktail of grants, crowdfunding, loans, community shares. If you think about the fact that um, you know, an extension to a community centre will often be coming out at half a million or three quarters of a million pounds, then it's unlikely you're going to find one source of funding who will pay for all of it. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, some of the capital grant funders. This is by no means an exhaustive list. And it's not easy raising capital grant funding. Localities current um, campaign. The locality's current campaign um, around Save Our Spaces is looking at encouraging um, the development of grant funding to help people um, to, uh, to access the kinds of levels of grant funding they need to acquire and um, refurbish assets. So, Let's look, you know, in the first instance, if you've got a heritage building, which has heritage activities, then, you know, there are a number of support sources of funding, including the Heritage Lottery Fund. I know Europe is time limited, but don't forget about it at this stage. In particular, a number of local authorities have community-led local development programmes, um, which may have a capital element to them. So it may be worth checking out whether that's appropriate for your organisation. We know that local authorities don't have huge amounts of money at this point in time, um, but they may have specialist pots from local developments and things like that. And they can be really helpful in brokering in um, support, even if they can't provide support themselves. So well worth having a look at that. The big lottery used to be a really significant funder of community buildings in areas of deprivation. The Reaching Communities Building Strand is no longer um, available. There, you can get up to 100,000 in capital as part of a Reaching Communities bid. But you know, just be aware that lot, the big lottery have changed a lot of their pro processes and procedures. So do have a look at their website and check their new um, process for application. Sport England, if you do sport, if you've got a sports building, have a community asset fund, which will fund up to 150,000. 
Um, it's a rolling program of application, but very, very popular. Um, and bear in mind that, you know, there may be other specific sporting um, opportunities. Um, so check with um, lead bodies for particular sports. I wanted to mention Power to Change. Um, Power to Change is a specialist funding source for community businesses. So that is community businesses which trade to meet a particular need in a geographic area and which involve the community in every aspect of what they do. Um, they have application windows about every six months, probably due to have one early in the new year. Um, they can do up to about 250,000 in capital. Um, it is probably worth, if you aren't already, registering on their website so that they send you information as soon as the uh, Community Business Fund opens. Alongside that is the Bright Ideas Fund, which is a small grants fund, which can help you to develop some of your ideas um, around a community business, which could link to a community building or taking on land. Um, Bright Ideas, you can get information on, is open at the moment, and you can get information on the My Community website. And now we move on to crowdfunding. Now I'm talking about on loan donations, not loans. Um, there are, it's basically an online donation. Um, and there are a range of platforms out there. Um, you know, I'm most um, familiar with Space Hive, which focuses on places and spaces. Um, another very popular one is Crowdfunder. Effectively, what you do is work out what a project is going to cost, and that might be a major capital project, or it may be refurbishing a particular room in your community centre or something like that. You work out what it's going to cost, and then you secure pledges. Um, once you reach or exceed your target, those pledges are redeemed, and you get the money, and you do your project. I would say the key thing with crowdfunding is community buy-in. Um, Generally, the people who donate are the people who know your project and are keen to support you. Um, so there are great examples online with the crowdfunding um, platforms, which show how people have used um, crowdfunding and the ways in which they've um, encouraged people to donate. And um, you know, if if online is not your thing. Um, you know, it's not new, this kind of crowdfunding. Many of us who are a little older will remember things like buy a brick campaigns and so on. So crowdfunding can be a real um, addition to your armour in raising capital sums. And I'm now going to hand on to Kieran. Great, thanks so much, Debbie. I'm just going to mute you for one moment. So. So where does social investment come into this whole equation when you're thinking about funding options for your organisation? Well, if you're looking to grow your organisation, um, perhaps help with cash flow, uh, or perhaps buy an asset like a new building, then you may want to consider this as one of your many funding options for your organisation. So before I go into... Uh, bit more detail uh, what is it it's always think it's good to start here in case you're not familiar with the concept and we define social investment as quite simply the use of repayable finance to help your organization achieve a social purpose so it is repayable I have to emphasize that investors do expect their money back but unlike traditional investment they also want to see their money being used for good so a social as well as a financial return so as a community group or any other social sector organization, you repay the investment through a surplus. And that surplus may be generated uh, from trading or other activities such as contract payments or even grants, donation, or a combination of, of these things. It's worth noting also that other terms are often used, and you may have heard of these over social investment. So social finance is a common term or impact investing. Really, they all may mean the same thing. They mean the use of repayable finance to help you as an organization achieve that, that social purpose, that social impact. Now, obviously, social investment is just one option among many different funding uh, options for you. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with lots of these. And De Debbie has already 
touched upon some of them from the more traditional sources like grants and donations or even mainstream finance like your high street banks. And it's worth noting to not, not forget about these mainstream sources. If you can access finance from your local bank, then that may well be the best option for you. So it's, it's worth considering. But really, you should see social investment as just another tool that you can use in, in your arsenal of funding. Uh, and it's there really to help build the resilience and sustainability of the organization and maybe do you to do more of essentially the great work that you were set up to do. So before you consider it, um, I think that it is important to be clear about a number of things. What do you need the money for? Firstly, is it about buying an asset, um, whether that's a new building, uh, a vehicle or whatever it might be or, or in, indeed uh, re re renovating a, a, an asset but it might also be about helping you to grow a new service or innovate on a new service or product uh, it could even use it for cash flow uh, in the meantime whilst you develop a new income stream whatever the reason you need to be very clear about what you need that money for how much and also the type that you think is most appropriate and I'm going to be going on to some of the types that I think be worth considering as a community group shortly it is repayable, I've said this already, but you do need to be clear about how you're going to repay it. So Debbie's already talked about being clear about your, your business model and revenue. Repayment uh, can come from selling goods or services or via private contracts or to the public. But there may also be other income streams that you could help repay it that you may not have thought about. So this could include membership fees or donations to payments from a government contract or even rental income or a combination again of, of these different sources. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, investment is only a means to an end. So you, you do need to be clear about the impact that you're currently generating uh, and how this additional investment will help you to continue doing that. In particular, articulating the change that you're looking to create and also your ability to report on that. It's really crucial for social investors to see that before they see you as a, a viable investment. So now I'm going to go on to some of the, the types, the focus for, for community groups, some, some product types I think is worth considering. Uh, it really depends when you're looking at these on your legal model, amount you're looking for, what you need that money for, uh, and how much. And it's, it's best place to help you refine these product types um, it would be to go on to the Good Finance website and go on to the Is It Right For Us tool. And I'll be talking a little bit about that shortly. But firstly, just to cover off uh, four types today, these first two, similar in the sense that you're looking to receive investment from lots of in individuals. So firstly, we have community shares, and um, this is a withdrawable, non-transferable equity investment, so a share within your organization. It's withdrawable because the investor can take their money out of the organization if they choose to, but it's slightly different to conventional shares in that the holder of the community share cannot transfer them to another person. Um, it is worth noting it's only available to community benefit societies and co-ops. Uh, and if you want to set up your own community share offer, a good place to go is on the Community Shares Unit website or Community Shares Unit Scotland, uh, if you're based in Scotland. Or you can also sometimes do it via, via a platform. It's worth, worth also saying that Power to Change have a booster program available. So they make um, equity investments of up to 100K to match what societies can raise through community shares. And they also provide, um, rather helpfully, a development grant of up to 10k to help societies get investment ready uh, and meet the standards of best practice. Um, so community shares are a really useful way of gaining financial support from your local supporters and sometimes, although not always, um, investors won't necessarily expect their money back. Uh, it's more just they just want to see your, the, that local asset being successful. Um, we'll be hearing a bit more about community shares from Simon at Stratford Public Hall shortly. So crowdfunding investment, um, and this is an investment that's raised via an online platform. Uh, it's not secured against, against an asset, so we're building more equipment. And it's really about a crowd of individual investors putting mostly small amounts towards a loan to your organization, and then you repay that on an agreed basis, usually with interest on top. It's a particularly useful way to raise small amounts, so 5K to 50K relatively quickly. And it's worth saying that we're talking here about crowdfunding investment, not rewards-based crowdfunding, which Debbie already covered off. Uh, and this kind of finance you can access from specialist platforms, so the likes of FX you may have heard of, or crowdfunders have already been mentioned, and also Community Chest as well. It's similar to uh, Community Shares, and investors are likely to also be supporters. Uh, but, but do be aware that this kind of finance can take time 
uh, and a lot of effort um, potentially in order to get investors interested and willing to invest in you and in, in your organization. So secured loans, um, you may well have heard of these. These are one of the most common types of social investment. Um, and the investment essentially works like a mortgage on a house. The investor provides the organization with a loan against an asset. So again, that's often building equipment uh, as a collateral. And alternatively, the, or an organization's parent company may offer its shares in the organization as collateral. So those are two different versions of, of, of the same thing. Really. And you can repay that loan on an agreed basis. So that would be regular monthly payments normally, usually with interest on top. You may might use this when it comes to covering some or all of the cost of buying an asset. Uh, for example, your organization's office building, a community asset such as a community center, or expensive equipment such as a bus. Um, and secured loans are available from social banks, but they're also available from high street banks. Uh, foundations, individual social investors might also make these kind of secured loans and are also specialist social investment funds out there and I'll talk about how you can access them uh, in a moment. Uh, the, some of the pros I suppose of, of uh, secured loans, interest is often lower than secured loans because you obviously have that asset as collateral. But do be aware that it's not available if you don't own a building or another large asset or have a parent entity willing to offer its shares in an organization as collateral. And then lastly, blended finance. So this is a mixture of grant and loan. Um, it's a package of funding that's really a mixture of investment that needs to be repaid and a grant that doesn't need to be repaid, obviously. Um, and you might use this as a new organization, perhaps needing some grant funding to reach the point where you're then able to take on investment and repay it, or perhaps as an existing organization looking to expand your new activities that then, you know, that may not generate enough profit to repay the, an investment without some form of grant funding. Um, obviously the, the, the positive to this is very much it bridges the gap between grant funding and investment and also reduces the risk that you will not be able to re repay investment. But it's, it's worth noting that uh, it's only likely to be available for investments of 250K or less. Um, so slightly, uh, slightly small amounts on the, the broader social investments funding spectrum. Um, just to note, uh, later this year in uh, September, we'll be looking to do uh, a whole webinar on blended forms of grant and loan. So do tune in to that um, um, if you're interested in this type of finance. So um, I can talk for, for hours really on the details of social investment and other product types, but we'll unfortunately don't have the time today to do that. So. Um, luckily, the reason Good Finance was set up was to help you do just that. So it's a free, free online platform to help you better understand social investment and find sources of finance from investors. So just quickly on what it provides, um, educational resources and material through, through structured content. This is to help better understand what social investment is, who the investors are, and there's also more, far more detail on, on, the, on the product types, so that's some of those I've just outlined in that section as well. The diagnostic tool I've just mentioned, this is about, uh, it takes about two to three minutes to complete. And it just asks you questions about your organizations, like your legal model, amount of money you're looking to raise. Uh, it helps you work out firstly, if social investment's right for you, or if not, uh, why not? Uh, and if so, where you can go to access further support um, and also the types of social investment you should consider. So you don't have to spend hours looking into something that isn't even appropriate for you. The Investors and Advisors Directory, great place to find uh, the social investors that, that are out there. There's now over 60 listed on this section of the website, so do use that, use that uh, directory and filter according to your needs and see who's providing finance. We have um, case studies, so examples of other organizations who've taken on various forms of social investment all the way up and down the country. And we also have news and events section, so that you can see there's workshops that are taking place near you. Uh, and also impact measurement tools as well. So do check it out. And then just lastly, um, one final thing worth looking at, uh, particularly if you're a community group, is the social investment tax break. Uh, social investment tax relief is a tax break which encourages individuals to support social sector organizations uh, by offering a 30% tax break when investing in, in, in that in, uh, eligible organization. And I recommend that you all sign up to the Get SITR campaign from Big Society Capital. It's completely free. Uh, it provides a package of support to help you raise investment via this channel. 
So that's uh, all for me. I'm now going to hand over to Simon from um, Stratford uh, Public Hall. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so, yeah, um, obviously, uh, Kieran and Debbie have, have talked a bit about um, community shares as a, a, a way of raising finance for a um, social enterprise. Um, so I'm just going to uh, talk about our experience of uh, running a community share offer, which we, um, we uh, launched uh, last year. Um, at the beginning of 2017. Um, so I've only got 10 minutes, so um, it's, I'm gonna have to kind of go through, through go a few things quite quickly, but if anyone wants any more information, uh, we have quite a lot of information on our website and we're more than happy to talk to people about our experience in more detail. Um, so first of all, I'll just give you a bit of context about Friends of Stratford Public Hall. Um, and, and really, um, naturally, um, we, uh, we as an organization exist because of this building. Uh, which um, is in Stretford, uh, which is um, three miles outside Manchester city centre. If um, people know the area, um, it's quite a mixed community of about 35,000 people. Um, and one of the main things that um, Stretford has lacked is a, um, a central kind of community space um, or a civic uh, area. Uh, this is largely, you'll probably see from the picture, there's a dual carriageway that runs right through the middle of Stretford, um, which um, uh, essentially was... Um, built in the 60s to provide um, access into the city centre from the south of the, um, the city region. Um, and what, what this did was really kind of um, cut the, um, the neighbourhood in, in two. And it meant that there wasn't really any natural community space um, in the locality. Um, this building was actually originally built for the people of Stratford by John Rylands um, in 1878. Uh, John Rylands was a uh, Manchester cotton magnet who had... Um, uh, who lived nearby and um, as was the way um, then there was a strong responsibility around philanthropic giving and so um, John Ryan's built the building uh, for the people of Stretford. Um, so it's had quite a mixed history over um, the best part of 150 years um, and in its more re recent um, uh, times it was actually a, um, uh, owned by Trafford Council, the local authority, and was run as an office uh, space for them. So um, back in 2015, the council essentially were looking to dispose of the, the site as part of a consolidation um, of, of the council and started to um, uh, essentially uh, go out and look at potential interest for the building. And at this point, um, the community essentially rallied around the pro possibility that um, it could be brought back into community use. Um, so essentially using the um, um, localism, localism Act, we listed it as a... Um, an asset of community value and then um, went through an asset transfer process with Trafford Council. Um, and essentially a, a big campaign um, was started in 2015 where um, the, you know, the, the general thrust was the idea that this should come back into community hands. Um, and so um, over the course of that year, I, we um, set up a, a community benefit society with the idea that the hall could um, come into ownership of the society and be dem democratically owned and run by the community. Um, and at, at the beginning of 2016, we were actually successful in, in the asset transfer. Um, and as you can see, um, the, the whole goal was to essentially take on the ownership and running a Stratford Public Hall for the benefit of the community. Um, so um, over, over the course of 2016, we, we developed a number of activities to essentially put in place our um, ambition to turn the hall into a multi-purpose community hub. Um, so, some, so these are the kinds of things that we now run from the hall. Um, so we run well-being classes, we have a community choir, community cinema. We also have workspace um, across the building. Um, uh, one of those being Loft House, but we also have a number, no, a number of community-facing tenants in the building. Um, and then uh, we also host uh, events. So we've had art, art exhibitions, concerts, social gatherings, and uh, Christmas events as well. Um, and this all has happened um, within our ballroom. Um, now, the main thing was the, the ballroom is a really fantastic space, but it would have been um, sort of neglected over the years and, and really needed um, uh, renovation and restoration. Um, so we um, essentially, one of the first, the major phases of, of bringing the hall back into its former glory was to focus on the ballroom. Um, and we recognised that because we um, set up a community benefit society, and we built we built a big supporter base that we could go to that supporter base to raise some of the investment we needed um, to bring the ballroom back into use. Um, 
and extend the capacity through a community share offer. So hopefully there's a picture of the ballroom in its uh, current state. As you can see, it's looking rather tired um, in its kind of initial use as a, um, an office space. Um, but largely quite a few of the things that we need to address were things that you can't really see. So structurally, because um, it's on the first floor, uh, we needed to improve the, um, the floor so we could extend the capacity um, to um, 400 people. We needed to improve the fire escapes, um, the uh, sound insulation, uh, because it's in a residential area, so we could um, increase our curfew, um, extend our curfew, um, and a number of other um, uh, alterations and improvements. So this inspired our community share offer, um, and we started to develop our targets, um, which I will hopefully can show you now. Um, so um, essentially, we, re we, we worked out that we'd need about £250,000 um, to um, renovate the, the ballroom to um, its full potential. Um, the thing with the community share offer is that you, you have scope to um, set a number of targets. Um, so we worked out what we could, our absolute minimum was um, to basically have a, um, a viable um, ballroom so that we set that at uh, 200,000. Uh, and we also recognized that we could um, in, you know, do some things that would just be nice to have. So uh, um, introducing a sound system, a stage. Um, so we had a kind of rationale for, uh, for potentially raising up to 300,000. Um, as you can see, the, the, the extra sort of um, um, sophistication in our targets, um, sorry, if you could just go back a slide, um, was that we, um, we, we were one of the um, pilot uh, programs for um, the Community Shares Booster program where we were able to access 100,000 pounds of match, up to 100,000 pounds of match funding that would be um, matched against our community investment. So you can see here how that match kind of um, interacted with our targets. Um, uh, and so we, we built that into how we started to um, uh, de design the share offer. Um, so that was our kind of goal. And then we launched it in February 2017. Uh, and um, this, uh, can, this sort of shows you that what, what we did um, in the best part of two months. Um, so, um, in the end, we, 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 um, we secured, uh, around, uh, 800, uh, community investors, uh, came in and, and, and supported the community share offer. Um, we, um, then had, we did also, um, go out to a number of organizations and institutions to, to invest. And obviously we had the hundred thousand from power to change through the booster program, but we also attracted investment from a number of local organizations that were supporting what we were doing. So the local housing association invested, um, a local co-op um, um, invested, a, um, even a, um, a dance organization that were going to use the ballroom for dance activities um, supported us. So uh, as you can see, there was a pretty even split between the amount of investment that came from organizations uh, um, and um, the local community. Uh, but importantly, um, because we're a society, that it's a one member, one vote. So. Um, everyone has the same say in how we run the organization. So um, it, it means that we have a, you know, um, despite a large proportion of the investment coming from a handful of organizations, it's still a, a broadly democratic organization where the local community have a real say in, in what we do. Um, so I've got a, a few more slides showing um, the breakdown of our investment. So um, this just shows you a sort of geographic spread. So Stretford um, as an area has the M32 postcode. So you can see that overwhelmingly our um, investors came from the local area, um, two thirds. Um, and, and our campaign was really locally driven. So we um, did a lot of community events to um, tell people about what, 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 why it was important to become a member and investor in Stretford Public Hall. Um, we did um, flyering of pretty much every household in, in, the, in the area. Um, we, we use social media, uh, we got quite a lot of local press as well. Um, we did access some investment from neighbouring um, uh, areas, um, but as you can see, the overall it was a, a locally um, a driven um, investment raise. Um, the other thing we did was we um, offered an instalment um, uh, uh, proposition, which was, was really key. So we, our minimum investment was £100 
which we recognize is, you know, for, for, for many people is a large commitment and a large sum of money to, to, to put into uh, in one go. So we offered a, um, a, a, an, an approach whereby um, residents could uh, invest um, their £100 over four, £25 installments over four months. Um, and this was actually quite a popular um, uh, uh, offer. And so a third of our investors um, uh, invested £100 using the instalment um, offer. So we feel that was a really important um, um, facility to have to make the, invest the share offer as inclusive as possible to the local community. Um, so our average inv individual investment was, was £160. So as you know, you can see it's quite a, a substantial sum. Um, and I think it reflected the fact that people recognised this was more than a donation and that it was an investment. And we'd, you know, had uh, drafted a community share offer document and a business plan, which we um, hoped would set out a clear uh, business case for how we were going to use the investment and how that was going to support uh, our organisation in running the hall sustainably and profitably. Uh, and essentially, uh, we are committing to pay our investors a small interest payment of 2%. Uh, from next year uh, and then um, allow um, investors the prospect of getting their investment back uh, in uh, from 2021. So just to give you um, uh, a breakdown of, of our investors um, and the amounts, so as you can see, um, over half our investors um, invested that um, around that £100 mark uh, and then we, you know, uh, had a... Um, a handful of, of, of larger investors, um, um, which allowed us to hit our total. But um, overall, um, you know, the, I think the key the key thing was that um, it, because we were a, a society that um, every we, we were very, it was very important to us that every um, investor became a democratic member and had an equal say um, in how the hall is run for the benefit of the community. So, um, so I know I might. Have just gone on a bit too long <laughs> but that's a very quick uh, overview of our, of our share offer um, and the money although it was um, uh, quite um, you know involved a lot of effort and um, during that campaign period so it's definitely not for the faint-hearted <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that, um, Simon. Uh, that was really, really interesting to hear your experience and your Stratford Public Hall's um, journey, I suppose, um, from to, to raise investment via, via community shares. Uh, so we're gonna move on now to a Q&A session. So just bear with me while I pull up um, the set of questions just to see if anyone has um, uh, asked any. I think there's, there's one here from Graham. Uh, it's for you, uh, Simon. Um, is asking um, what what were some of the the challenges that you faced along the way from 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 do, doing this method and were there any points when you thought actually this is going to be too too difficult to raise the right amount of finance via community shares? Yeah, I mean, I think probably the you know the the really the big challenge was the community engagement side because we were not just securing our investment from one institution one organization we had to design a campaign which you know took a lot of planning uh, we probably started six months um so yeah we we um set our launch date on the 2nd of february 2017 but we actually started the planning in october 2016 so that was just doing um we produced a promotional film we did a pledging campaign. We started to get some media interest. We obviously had to write our offer document and make sure our business plan was viable. And we uh, went for the community shares standard mark, uh, which is like a quality mark to demonstrate the, um, uh, that our share offer was um, you know, of, of sufficient quality. We also obviously had the, the negotiations around the booster at the same time. So we were having discussions with institutions at the same time of designing campaigns. So you, generally in order to do this you need a long lead in time it's not something you can just launch and hope for the best um and and we definitely during the campaign itself it was quite um you know we, we the um the, the practice shows that you'll get a, an an, in, uh, an influx of investment at the beginning and some at the end and we definitely but not much would happen in the middle and we definitely felt that so halfway through we saw it tail off and um 
it definitely kind of hit our morale <laughs> when we thought maybe we wouldn't make it. And then it was really just important to keep going. So just campaigning and, and a lot of that was just word of mouth and trying to get people to kind of um, get behind the campaign. Great, thank you, uh, Simon, for that. Apologies for the slight um, technical difficulties there. And then there's just a, one more question here on St Stratford Public Hall. Is the uh, share offer document and business plan shareable at all, Simon? Yeah, so it's on our website. So if you go on to our website and there's um, under About Us, there's a whole page around our community share offer where you can see, can find our share offer document and business plan and other information that um, uh, we uh, provided as part of the share offer so uh, links to our films and that kind of thing great thank you um there's one here about uh my organization from emily my organization is not so much a business uh, as such more community interest group not ability to make profit etc what are the best ways to sm source small amounts of funding a few hundred to a thousand uh debbie are you happy to take that question yeah very happy to do that one um i think um, there's lots of information out there about, um, you know, grant making trusts, which will do anything from small amounts of money um, to, you know, the kinds of money we're looking for here with uh, capital. Um, you can find information, um, you know, if you've got a library that's still open, many of them will have reference books which set out um, local grant funders. Um, you may have a local, there may be a directory of local, organ, of local grant funders in your area. Um, there are online platforms, but they are generally paid for services. Um, there's Funding Central, which is a free service which you can subscribe to um, for free. Um, and I think you just, you, you know, I get the uh, information through. I think you probably just Google Funding Central and you'll find the information. Um, if you're looking for small amounts of money, there are obviously you can also do small scale fundraising um, within your local area. One source of funding which a lot of people use is Awards for All, which is a small grant program from the lottery, um, which will give up to £10,000 for a particular project. Fairly simple, straightforward application process. So do have a look at that. I mean, the keys with a lot of grant funding is that grant funders, um, you know, are interested in the social value of what you do. And um, particularly for people who are trying to raise money for land and buildings, that, you know, can be quite a big issue. So you do need to do your research, work out which funds you're likely to be eligible for, what, whether you meet their criteria, and also the timescales. Some funders only meet um, once or twice a year. So they may not be able to respond quickly enough. And of course, you know, there's no guarantee of getting funding from a particular source. So you need to spread your options. Great, thank you for that, uh, Debbie. I'd also just add, so yeah, absolutely. Funding Central is a great um, starting point as well, but there are a couple more. So Beehive Giving is also an, a good place to go to uh, as well. Um, so there's um, another one here from uh, about around grant funding to do to access grant funding. Do I need a certain organizational structure um, at the moment? It's just me. Um, Debbie, are you happy to take that question again as well? Yeah. It, you will generally need to have a structure which I mean, for most grant funders, um, for most grant making trusts will want the funding to be used for community good or for the good of a particular section of society and your organizational structure needs to show that um, there are, there isn't you know the criteria when you look up different grant funding sources um, they they will give criteria which say you must be a registered charity or we'll consider funding from registered charities and kicks um, community interest companies and things like that um, 
Things like Awards for All will give to unincorporated organisations. That's the name given to, you know, a group of people who are set up to do something within the community for the community good, but don't have a particular legal structure. However, if you're going for something like Awards for All, you do need to show that it's kind of wider than one person and that you have thought about, you know, you've involved the community and that there is a clear community purpose and an accountability to the local community. So it's not a particular organisational structure, but you do need to show it's been doing, done for the public good. And if there's only one person, that would raise issues um, about whether it's, you know, for, per, for personal gain or for public good. So it's about demonstrating, you know, that it's being done for community or public uh, benefit. Great, thanks for that, Debbie. Um, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our session today. So apologies for all of those who've asked questions and we haven't been able to answer them. Please do just drop us an email um, if you have, have a question um, and we'll be available uh, to, to answer those. So thank you. Um, before we finish up, um, I just want to, uh, worth mentioning again, that this webinar recording will be available to view again. It'll be on our Good Finance YouTube channel. And also apologies to those who attended the first webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, the recording is still just trying to be accessed. And as soon as we have, have that recording, it will be sent round to all attendees. Um, as I said at the start, it, this is the second in a new series of webinars um, that we'll be putting on. The next one is on Tuesday next week on impact measurement. So if you're interested in that, do sign up to it on the Good Finance events page. Um, and the rest of these events will also be available in due course on that section of the website. So sadly, we've come to the end of our time today. So I just want to say a big thank you to Debbie from Locality and Simon. Um, so Debbie from Locality and Simon from um, Stratford. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, I hope all attendees uh, found it useful. Please do get in touch if you have any questions. Um, thank you and have a great rest of your day and do go out and enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Bye.